All right, hello everybody. Uh, good to see everybody today. Uh, I am sorry that I haven't been streaming in a while. I broke my leg and so I have been recovering from that. I just wanna make sure before we get going that the audio is good. So I'm Randall, uh, this is Sunil. Hey guys. Uh, we're gonna be talking to you guys today about deep learning and MXNet and Keras and just basic concepts around machine learning and deep learning. And I am here as a student as well. So Sunil is the expert, I am the novice. And so he's gonna be teaching me and I'm gonna be asking a bunch of questions along the way. But one of the things that Sunil asked me to do before we got started was to spin up our deep learning AMI. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. I'm just gonna log in to our console here. Uh, it shouldn't take very long. Um, and this is what I call one and a half factors of authentication. Because I have a little hotkey that auto generates the, uh, anyway. So we'll hop over into EC2 and I'm gonna launch an instance. This is in US East one. I guess I could launch this a little bit closer to home. Let's go to US West. So we can launch this instance. Uh, I am going to do it's deep learning. So this is the deep learning AMI Ubuntu version. Is that the one we want? The Ubuntu version? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to launch this. Oh, by the way, um, I'm going to give you a little hint. It's actually not just uh, Marketplace now. You can actually uh, get it from the dropdown uh, within the AMI list. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let me actually do that because I've never done that before. In the dropdown? Yeah, so if you go back, uh, just like quick start. In the quick start. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Look so at that idea. Should I go with the Amazon Linux version? Uh, Ubuntu is good. Um, okay. Uh, all right. That one seems more up to date too. And because I like cool things, I'm gonna go with this P2 16X large. <laughs> I realize um, that's not exactly in keeping with the frugal nature of Amazon, but um, uh, I think in 8XL, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll, uh, we'll use some, um, you know, we'll try to use and parallelize with the GPUs and see uh, if we can get speed up, but our data set is tiny, so, uh, but definitely there's going to be speed up using CPU versus GPU. Let's launch this. So if this is only a two hour broadcast, this will only cost like $4. <laughs> Not bad. I probably should have done a spot instance. Spot instance, we probably could have gotten by with like 30 cents. Oh, well. Yeah. Next time, next time. So this is gonna launch. This is gonna take a second to uh, come up. I don't think it'll take too long though. Um, yeah, it should be less than uh, less than a minute, usually. I don't actually know how to log into the Ubuntu uh, instances. We um, have uh, Ahmed Kalaski who's asking what instance type is good to save money. Uh, you know what? We, we should be able to train with uh, a CPU. So uh, like a C4 large uh, should be good enough. Um, but if you... Um, if you if you want to spend a G, uh, um, use a GPU, you can use a G2 um, XL as well, G22 XL. So between between the, those two, you should be good. Alrighty.
And then I am TJK ask if we could balance the levels on the voices. Uh, is it my voice that's louder or Sunil's? Yeah, I can fix that. So we're just waiting here for this instance to spin up and then I'm gonna kick it over to the data set. And what's gonna happen is while uh, Sunil is trying to, to fix all of this and, and build it all, I'm gonna be following along and asking questions and I'm gonna try and do it on, on my side, on my screen as well. So hopefully we should be able to get all that situated. So this is still initializing. And then we'll show people how to set up a tunnel uh, so that they can just um, um, you know, use the browser to connect. To this instance? Yeah. Sweet. OK, cool. So I have this, and I'm just going to run talk. And we have a whole lot of stuff. This is way cool. This is a huge instance. <laughs> yeah, it's I, uh, I've only got it's one point two teraflops. I've got seven hundred and twenty gigs of RAM. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. So I think we're good to go. I've got my instance for this. Um, yeah. I lowered my uh, voice level a little bit. I think we are. Ready to switch over to you? Yeah. Um, you want to show like how to set up Jupiter? Um, so just run Jupiter. Is Jupiter already on here? Yeah. So it comes. Uh, the cool thing about the instance is it comes bundled with all the deep learning frameworks and all the Python uh, uh, libraries um, uh, and Anaconda setup as well. So Keras, MXNet, TensorFlow, uh, Cafe, all of it is uh, available. Uh, all the cool DNN drivers, um, everything um, is, is single click, right? Like you, we didn't need to download all the NVIDIA drivers. So, you know, in a couple of minutes or three minutes, uh, we have a big instance up and running. Um, and also Jupyter is available. So we can just... Uh, so I just run like Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, just Jupyter Notebook and you're all good to go. I mean, you, you might want to know how it so that you know, no hop and ampersand, so it's running in the background. Eh, that's just fine. So, Do you know why it's not starting yet? Oh, there we go. OK. So um, let me, like, yeah, me, and then um, one more time and I'll, like, set up a tunnel. OK, and how do I do the tunnel setup? Uh, give me a second. I'll give you the command. I, I imagine it's just like SSH-L yep. through um, like a proxy. Yeah, let me give you, let me paste in the chat so that everybody has, um, I'm just modifying the ports to reflect. I haven't set up an SSH tunnel in years, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be SSH dash capital L and then yeah. some port forward. So, in. yeah, I, I pasted that. So, dash essentially, dash. we're just uh, saying, hey, uh, localhost mapping on uh, your laptop, you know, 8888, and then uh, it's running on 888. A dash I uh, pointed to your uh, pointed to your PEM key. And then Ubuntu, because we've used Ubuntu here, Ubuntu at the IP address. Now, um, folks, if you're using um, Amazon Linux, it would be EC2 dash user. So I think that worked. Yeah. That looks good. So now if I go to localhost. And then, 
Yeah, you can copy the link that the Jupyter Notebook through because you'll need the passcode. Yeah, we can sure. copy that as yeah, we can copy that as well. There you go. Sweet. So now I have this thing, this shindig running on this giant powerful instance with 720, like a, a couple teraflops of compute. I, I'm excited. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and follow along with everything that you're going to do next. Um, okay. But this is so, cool, like running a cool. notebook remotely. Yeah, all right. I like this so far. Um, so let let's. Over to you. Okay. All right, I think uh, your screen is on. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll um, take a really um, simple problem, which is um, we'll do sentiment analysis on movie reviews. Um, for simplicity, we'll just say, hey, the review is positive, or the review is negative. So we'll just have two two classes essentially. So sentiment uh, analysis is, is is just saying whether or not the words in the post come across as a whole as positive or as negative? Yeah, so um, yeah, the model eventually learns uh, how uh, it's not just looking for particular, um, uh, it, it's hard to say, but more, uh, more likely than not, the model actually learns uh, how the words interact with each other and uh, the overall sentiment of um, the structure uh, of what we put in there is positive or negative. And at, at the end, we'll, we'll use this for movie reviews, but uh, my aim is that we will type in arbitrary text and we'll, we'll test it at, uh, as well. So if I so, type in something like, yeah. I really hated this, it was awful. It, like uh, somebody leaving a review of our Twitch stream, for instance, yeah. they could say like, this yeah. is just <laughs> everything that's wrong with the world. At large, yeah, and that would have a negative sentiment. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, um, uh, I'm sure it will. So, out so, of curiosity, is that like a binary classification then, since it's either positive or negative? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we can start to say that as a binary classification. But what we'll do is we'll create two classes, and we'll find the probability of how likely is that sentiment positive and negative. So we'll attach probabilities to both rather than just having it uh, discreetly one or zero. So then it's like a confidence value. Correct. Correct. Cool. OK. And this data set has 50,000 movie reviews. Uh, They're all tagged and labeled. So if you can go ahead and download this data set, um, there'll be a start. So this is going to be. Uh, ai.stanford.edu. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to paste it so that, oh, shit. Oh, I changed my screen. Sorry, guys. All right. There you go. Oh, uh, I have to I figure will... out what's the best way to uh, post link on uh, Twitch here. Let me mod you really fast, and then the link won't get deleted. Uh, All right. Just in the Sorry, interest guys. of time, I'll go ahead and post it. Okay, so okay. I'm going to download this. Um, and as you're downloading, let me let me start coding here. So let's load the. I have to turn off my Alexa. Sorry. <laughs> Load data, so uh, just importing some of the basic libraries here. Uh, so path equal to so as so you can see, uh, I've already downloaded so AC, ACL, MDB. This is the path. So already like um, oh, that was um, 
trying to trying to just show one level. <laughs> I've not used this command in ages. One of my favorite things about this Ubuntu AMI so far is I, I, I was just grabbing the data and normally I always type I always have this habit of typing wget, but yeah. then wget is never installed by default. Like curl is always yeah. installed by default, but wget I know. never is. I know. And I as soon as I typed wget and pressed enter, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to sudo apt get install this, and it is actually already <laughs> installed. So thank you for. I, I hear you. I so I even have wget on my Mac. <laughs> It's a much, uh, it's a more preferable tool to download things than curl. Um, so yeah, as you can see, like um, there's the tree structure uh, of our data set. And using that, I am going to, um, yeah, I'm gonna try and load all the, I'll just do, I'll just basically create a, array of all the paths. Um, it's positive. Um, and then um, we'll just add uh, all the list basically. So for f, f in os.list um, uh, essentially, so yeah, this should should give me. So, if yeah. I were gonna write that in Python uh, to be like cross-platform, I would probably do like os dot path dot join path. Yeah, os dot path. I know. Yeah, exactly. no. This, yeah, this works so. too. I am uh, <laughs> I'm taking shortcuts here given uh, the amount of time and uh, I'm not going to be necessarily pep eight compliant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. Although, I, although I'd like to be. It's, uh, yeah, so. So this is just a list comprehension for building out the list of files that we're going to use. Right. And this is just the positive files that we're looking at right now. Yeah, now I'll just, uh, I'll just build an array of uh, all, all the paths essentially a list of all the paths, right? Gotcha. So it's easier, so, so train. Um, so we'll keep all the, uh, uh, like we'll keep it alternating. So, um, so neg. Right. And um, so uh, Kachitim, I don't know if I'm saying that name right, but it's a username, so uh, we'll just go with it, uh, says that what approach are we using for sentiment analysis? Is it naive phase classifier, logistic regression, or binary classification? And I think the answer in this case is that we already have some form of classification that's coming in from this data set. Like they've already been categorized into positive reviews or negative reviews, whether that was done by humans or some other method. We, we have some idea. And what we're doing is we're using that classification to build a model that can recognize future examples. Is that accurate or am I totally off? Yeah, no, no, that's fair. Um, I think uh, what the user probably is asking is what method are we gonna use? Uh, so I was gonna come to that after we do the data, but uh, at a high level, we'll use multi-layer perceptron. Um, so it's one of the simplest, uh, <laughs> simplest neural network there. Random multi role. <laughs> multi-layer perceptron? <laughs> That sounds like a, a transformer. What exactly uh, is that? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll start, um, you know, once we load the data, I think we'll wait for more users to come in. Uh, I have a whole slide on some of the basics, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll get there slowly. Um, so let's, uh, um, like, I want to talk about how we format the data, how to think about uh, the data first and kind of bridge the gap between data to problem, and then we can go into how we actually end up solving the problem. So okay. for okay. folks who are curious, multi-layer perceptron, um, that's, a, that's a very easy network to comprehend, uh, uh, but the concepts that we're gonna learn are applicable to 
future complex networks that we'll build in this series. Okay. All right. I never know if uh, this is going to compile, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, what you're going to do is, so for each file, um, actually, I don't think this is going to work because what we want is a list of all files. Instead of uh, like expanded array. Yeah. I so, think you're missing a comma, by the way, on the. Um, yeah. Um, well, you know what? I, I probably could just append. Right. So this is why I love Jupyter. I'm going to show you why I love Jupyter now. Um, so da -da -da. so I, I'm slowly but surely following along here. I am writing the code in my own way, though. Yeah, you should. Uh, yeah, we have a cleaner way of doing uh, than I have. So I'm trying to keep up, though, and, and talk at the same time. We'll see if I can actually do that. Uh -huh. When you say words like multi-layer perceptron, I, I start to get pretty scared. Uh, I'll just see. Uh, oops. There you go. First syntax error. There you go. A second two. I don't think it's just uh, it doesn't like. Uh, all right. List typos. Instead of yeah. Fun of live coding. Nope. Uh, I think that's where the OS dot path that join thing failed. So you exactly. gotta have another slash. And, um, yep. No, I, I actually think it's on the train and test, or maybe on the end of the path variable. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah, see, I think uh, we've got we've got what we want so that now we can iterate through all the files. Um, also, um, I'd say like most of the common data sets that people end up using is the MNIST data set, which is uh, um, which is essentially handwritten digit recognition. And frankly, it seems like it's been beaten to death <laughs> by so many people. So I wanted to try and use a different data set here, which is a little cooler. Um, so I want to thank uh, David Ping, one of uh, our colleagues here, um, to uh, attempted to do it with this data set. So thanks to him. And then uh, should we have one? Jeff Bar points out that we have slash test slash neg twice. Should one of those be slash test slash pause? Oh, yes. Thanks, Jeff. Good call. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, for F and files. Uh, now, um, what we'll do is we'll open up. So we'll read the file, right? Um, and uh, we'll strip some uh, characters out. Um, so, for example, you know, let's let's take a look at this file to see what the contents look like. Um, well, um, just, yeah, some of these uh, uh, have like angle braces and so on. So we'll um, we'll need a regular expression um, uh, to substitute for those things. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so, and also we'll, what we'll do is we'll just create our, uh, what we'll call is um, input, uh, our input text essentially. Uh, we'll, we'll create a uh, 50,000 large uh, vector essentially where we'll store all of this. Um, we'll, we'll iterate through all the files, uh, we'll remove whatever uh, characters that we don't need, and we'll put it in here. So, files. Um, uh, we can do something like, I know, could just. I mean, I don't want to do inline. I, I want it to be more readable. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, what what we want to do is uh, we'll say output equal to we'll we'll have some I'll define a function called remove tags uh, that's going to do this fun uh, do this functionality for us. So remove tags is going to take uh, which is going to keep going. Sorry? Keep going. I, I, I'm just saying I got to catch up with you here because I had paused to like watch, but now I'm good. <laughs> Um, tag something like this. Um, we're just going to substitute uh, the text with nothing, but we need to create the our tag uh, regular expression. So re dot compile. Oh, no, uh, yeah, compile. Yes, I think so. so we're going to say angle braces. Um, what else? Um, Right. Um, well, I don't know. It's been a while since I've done. <laughs> always gets. This is always. Uh, you know. It's like I feel envious about people who can just write regular expressions yeah. immediately. Um, I think this is good enough for now. Um, We'll yeah, see. I mean, if, you, if you're just looking for those two things, that should be good. And then uh, x z zero points out that you need to do out plus equals probably. Yeah, no, no, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna oh, add right. it to gotcha. uh, so essentially um, not the most Pythonic of ways, but we'll do out. Actually, what we need to do is, is join all the words together. So Based on join. Okay. Let's see what happens. Nope. Expected string or buffer. Okay. Tags, read lines. Um, read lines is going to come in as an array of lines, I think. Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you want the, the regex to apply glo globally, I think you can put. Um, a flag in there like re.global that'll go across lines and then you can put like a raw string in front of that. Yeah, but... I, I, you know what? Yeah, so what I, what I probably, I'll just join the lines. Um, so what I'll do here is, right, okay. because, yeah, I'll just join all the lines and give it a single text. Yeah, that should do it. Yeah, that worked. Well, that seems reasonable. OK. All right, so, so now comes um, the, the portion, right? So we, we don't necessarily deal with sentences, but we want to deal with words because we want to see how words interact with each other. Um, so in, in general, uh, text processing, natural language processing, there's a whole, um, there's a whole process uh, where we tokenize uh, the sentences. So what we'll do is we'll break down, we'll just keep a dictionary of words, essentially, that, um, uh, the, that, that, uh, that occurs in our uh, corpus. So whatever the movie corpus that we have, let's get what all the unique words exist and we'll just uh, keep a mapping of where and how these words occur. So, because ultimately the neural network doesn't understand, um, say sentences, you know, we need, uh, it, it, it just knows, oh, uh, this word number 55 appeared here and 60 appeared next to it. Seems like there's a big pattern of 55 and 60 appearing together. So that's what ultimately the network learns. So we need to convert into that format. And is it just single pairs of words? Is it 
three words? Is it four words? Does it? Yeah. Does so, it... yeah. So that's a good question. So uh, there are techniques where we will take something called as bag of words or continuous. Uh, 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 you know, we'll we'll do a sliding window. Um, in this case, we'll just do very simple. Uh, we'll just take each word as it is. Okay. So we'll just and, take single words. And is that like we're assigning a word a numeric value because it's you know each unique word is going to get some sort of numeric value, and Correct. then that word is going to have a it basically a vector that moves the entire sentence or, or phrase in a direction of positive or negative. Uh, the collection, essentially, yes. Um, so we'll come to that particular aspect as we dive into how the neural network behaves. Um, but for now, I think the uh, the intuition is we need to break down uh, the sentences into words, uh, and we're looking at word relations. Okay. Um, so that's that's what. So what we'll do is we'll use a, a library from Keras, uh, which actually has some pre-processing things uh, like a tokenizer. So what it will do is tokenize, break all the words, but also it's going to build an index, uh, essentially given a word, uh, you know, which, um, you know, um, which words occur in which documents and so on. So it's pretty pretty useful. We won't use the inverted index necessarily here, uh, but we want uh, uh, unique tokens. So I think it's here. Keras preprocessing. processing that yeah there you go so we will use this library before, before uh, we jump into this what, what is keras exactly i sorry so yeah so keras is a high level um uh, you know deep learning interface um uh, which um which actually stands on top of other frameworks so what it does is um you know, as uh, you know, say deep learning frameworks kind of came about um, when there was Tiano and TensorFlow, uh, it appeared to be more complex because uh, of the declarative nature of uh, the frameworks. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Franco, uh, uh, Franco came up with uh, Keras, uh, essentially building a, a simpler uh, kind of abstraction over uh, uh, so that it was much easier for developers to pick up. Um, so uh, Keras currently actually has uh, uh, MXNet as a backend as well. So you can have um, uh, Tiano, TensorFlow, or MXNet. So you can write code in Keras, but switch the uh, actual underlying uh, backend. And it's pretty uh, useful for people who want to you know, already have Keras code, uh, we announced, uh, um, you know, um, the community announced support for uh, Keras 1.2 to um, as MXNet as a backend, uh, and given the scalability that MXNet has, um, you know, across multiple GPUs, it's it's really cool. You can take the same code now run across multiple GPUs with minimal change, uh, and I'll really cool. I'll come. To, yeah, so we'll we'll just import. Um, so tokenizer. Okay. So, um, yeah. So let me see the Twitch channel. It's hard to switch between. Do you have any questions? <laughs> oh, there you go. I think people are talking about cars. There you go. I think it's weird that McCandy's code got listed as a deleted link because it's definitely not. <laughs> He's, he, but the, the code that McCandy posted, or McCandy007 posted, was just review.scan looking for the word good uh, one or more instances. It's just a regex, or, or bad one or more instances, and then returning the count and figuring out which one is more. But the problem is, uh, if you do that, you um what about the phrase not bad not bad has a positive sentiment so tokenizer so you can see it takes uh so if you look at what 
the tokenizer takes. It takes a number of words. Uh, so essentially, when we talk tokenize, we want to say, hey, uh, this is our working set of uh, you know um, words, certain words we're not really interested in, so we're going to chop and discard that. Um, and then uh, we can have filters um, and so on. So we're going to say, so I'm just choosing um, 10,000 is a good number, right? So we'll just have 10,000 words in our vocabulary and we'll tokenize them. Um, so toke dot fit sentences, I think it's called fit, no, fit on. Let's see. Yeah, so we'll use this method fit on texts uh, to essentially uh, take this entire corpus that we have and generate our tokens. Next, um, so what I'll do is I'm just going to run that. And, oops, sorry, fit on text. And this used a GPU, it looks like. Uh, well, uh, so, um, so Tiano, uh, you know, outputs what uh, it's actually present. Um, the tokenizer itself um, doesn't necessarily use the GPU, so we can uh, we can we'll just inspect what's in that object, right? <laughs> so it's fun to see. So as you can see, there's a word index, there are word counts, uh, index docs. Um, so very very useful kind of people who have done. Um, say TF-IDF processing and uh, you know word, so this can this can do uh, 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 pretty efficiently, um, kind of this one stop all. There are other libraries as well like MLTK. Um, uh, there's some stuff with MLTK uh, that can do uh, this. Uh, but what I like here is it's kind of uh, this pre-processing library has brought all the goodies together, just kind of what we need. Um, so it's a much cleaner interface, I feel, um, than uh, using NLTK, a uh, bunch of stuff in NLTK. That's totally an option as well. Okay. Um, so the next thing is, um, Actually, um, what I'm going to do is only use. Um, huh, that's okay. I was just thinking if we should reduce the set, uh, but not a problem. When you say reduce the set, what's the advantage of that? Because I, I noticed that uh, you put in like the number. Do of we really need? I was thinking like, do we really need all the documents? Is kind of what I was thinking. Like some of the words are repeated and so on, but um, that's fine. We'll we'll see. We'll we'll change if uh, we need to. Now, the next uh, process is actually creating our training set. So we'll create our training and test set. So um, we're lucky that our data set is already kind of shaped into you know training set and uh, test set. Um, but uh, typically, when you get data, what we'll do is uh, split it into three ways. So what we'll do is split into training set, validation set, and a test set. Um, so a test set is when you know our model is completely ready or uh, data that the model hasn't seen at all, uh, we can just uh, uh, run so that we see uh, the accuracy. But typically we'll use a validation set along with a training set when we train. So the idea there is we'll keep this validation set hidden from, um, uh, fr uh, from uh, the model as we run through you know, different iterations. The idea there is, um, you know, as the model kind of sees the same kind of data, it really learns the pattern, right? And we don't, we don't necessarily want that completely because ultimately the model is going to predict on something that is novel. So is that like overtraining? Yeah, so overfitting. It's called overfitting. Over okay. Yeah. So the validation set, what it does is it keeps an eye. Uh, so we, we look at you know, how accurate it is 
um, uh, as, as we go. Um, oh, Randall. Yeah, my, my video cut out, sorry. Okay, all right, just, just confirming. All right. You can keep going. You can still hear me, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the validation, uh, you know, kind of uh, set keeps it in check. So ideally, we want the point where, uh, you know, ideally, if we're training the validation accuracy and the um, training accuracy increases uh, together. So let me actually uh, validation. This is really cool. Um, I'll just keep this. Uh, oh, yeah. So do you see this uh, curve? Uh, I do, yes. All right. Yeah, so what, as, as you can see, look at the blue one, right? Like where uh, when there's overfitting, what you'll see is the validation accuracy will drop. It doesn't go along with the training accuracy. So in the blue line, essentially, uh, you know, this sort of this point or this area is where our best model, generalized model, uh, you know, uh, is there. So, so this is kind of where we want. Ideally, if our models learning really uh, generalized things, we'll see the green curve in terms of validation accuracy. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's go. Um, so we'll um, we'll actually do is um, we'll we'll um, we'll actually uh, now change uh, or rather uh, we'll convert the text uh, to sequences. So so the idea is um, our model does not necessarily understand words, right? So uh, so the sequence is going to convert. It into numbers. We're going to replace words with numbers. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, text to sequence, sequences, or I don't know. I think it's sequence. Um, to so input text. So we only want the training data, right? So we have fifty thousand. So we're only going to get twenty-five thousand here. I bet it's sequences. No. Aha. Uh -huh. Twitchy fit on Twitchy fit you know, on is asking uh, if it makes sense to do any shuffling of the training, validation, and test sets. Absolutely. Uh, shuffling is a good idea. Uh, so what we're going to do later is we're going to declare iterators uh, in MXNet. And we'll just literally set a flag, says shuffle equal to true, and that's going to do all the magic for us. Awesome. So let's, you know, let's inspect. Um, Spain. Ooh. Something's off here. Uh, so it didn't return anything. Fit on sequences. Fit on sequence. Um, I have to move my laptop to see the bottom of your screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'm using the wrong. Uh, I think I'm using the wrong. What's it called? I, I think it's. Uh, we're converting from text, right? So text to sequences. Uh -huh. That's probably what it was. Aha. Gotcha. And that's what's giving it those. Correct. Ideas. OK. See there? Um, so let's do some sanity, right? So let's do length of and length of, you know, our input text of 0. So certain things have been, uh, you know, chopped because we really didn't need them. Gotcha. Okay. Is it, and there's a reason you're you're only passing in like the first twenty five thousand. 
No, that's our positive. Uh, uh, so that's our first uh, um, 25K um, because that's the entirety of our uh, training data set, right? So in our training data set, remember? Um, yeah, I get that we joined it all together, but is there a reason we're keeping that like all on the same variable? Is it because we have to do those? Yeah, so that's our, that's our entire training set. So this is, our, our training corpus is 25,000. Uh, we're gonna keep the next 25,000 for training. So what we'll do is something like this, x train equal to, so let's redo this, but we'll just switch the, right? So that'll be our, that x for input. So we'll have our y, so we'll use x as our input, y as our label. Uh, so essentially, so x test will be our, the rest of the, um, gotcha. Okay. Um, but we also need the uh, the y, right? So y train. Um, so we we actually need to generate our labels, right? So uh, so our label set. This is actually easy because uh, if you think about. Uh, we have very sequential labels, right? So we have uh, our training set, which is 25,000, but we have 12.5K as our um, as our positive uh, set, uh, reviews uh, and then our negative reviews, right? So, um, so, so what we'll do is uh, we'll say um, labels, equal to so we we can we can declare um we'll just declare a tuple um so we'll say um we'll give negative uh, positive as one so into 12500 right does that make sense i'm bad at math but yes Sorry, no, that's, there you go. But uh, remember, um, Z we Z have, oh, go ahead. so we need to multiply this by two because for our test set. So we'll have our 50,000, essentially we have our 50,000 uh, labels. So this will be our, for our training data set, our labels will be, you know, like this and y test equal to right okay uh z asked why we chose a 50 50 split for chain and test when most people choose 80 20 or 90 10. um nothing in particular we just happen to have the data set this way uh we're lucky in this data set that we have enough samples for testing, uh, but generally uh, anywhere between 10 to 30% uh, is a really good idea to uh, keep aside. Gotcha. Uh, just because, I mean, it's, it's arranged that way, right? So um, I thought it'd be, um, okay. Um, so now, um, Let's actually start. Uh, so here's one thing, right? We we can um, let me let me do this. X train of five four. So I'm just going to print out the length of. Um, see, look at that. There's such. There's a lot of variability in terms of the review size, right? Right. Summer. So what, what we want to do is normalize, right? Um, so as we train the network, everything needs to be, the input sequence length needs to be, um, uh, you know, consistent uh, across all our inputs. So what we'll do is uh, we, need, we now need to pad our, our sequences. So padding is process where we'll make everything a uniform size. So if we have 155 characters, we'll add uh, another 345. 
um, let's say 500 is a good number. If you look at, um, if you kind of look, everything is kind of around, you know, roughly, you know, around that. And also, I think that's enough text at that point to say if the review is positive or negative. We're not doing something super fancy. So I'm going to say uh, we'll just uh, pad it with like 500. So uh, pad land. So when, you, when we pad it up, like what, what are we exactly padding it up with? Is it? Uh, so it, it can be uh, it can be anything, um, you know, so gen generally speaking, we want to add something that is neutral value, right? Um, so it's a good practice to just use spaces. In our words, it's an empty word, right? It's not going to determine anything. Uh, but actually, honestly, like you can try and just put Randall as a padding. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it will still work because you, Randall appears like the network learns that, well, Randall's useless in this case. <laughs> no, that's true in all cases, actually. <laughs> uh so let's um so i'm gonna say x train equal to ah so we'll need to export another library sequence there you go so we'll use this essentially we're using this api uh the C pad sequence api uh, 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 call uh to do this so we'll do from Import pad sequences. I'll do I think it's just X max. Uh what does it take? It takes sequences and max length, so we're gonna say yeah. And we're going to do the same for our test data set. Right? Makes sense? Yeah. Uh, but also it does is uh, it converts. So, so a lot of us may be familiar with NumPy. So I'm going to import NumPy. Uh, it's going to be helpful because uh, we're looking, we need to convert everything into an array um, uh, to be fed into, um, it's easier to operate on uh, uh, these arrays. We can do some nice uh, matrix multiplications and so on, and we can feed it to MX10. Um, okay, so we'll, I think it was Y train MP array. I will do the same for test. Okay, so we've converted all of this into array. Um, so let's just print all these guys. Um, actually, let's just do a sanity check. So as you can see here, right, um, the uh, the label shape. So we have uh, our, our vector essentially looks like 25,000 into 500. So everything is uniform. And our Y train is 25,000 comma uh, nothing. Essentially, it means that we just have a scalar value there, right? So because it's just a zero or a one. So. Right, so we, we have that. Okay, so next is we'll we'll actually use uh, so we'll create we'll create iterators. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, no, I mean, we can pad it with, uh, we were just saying is, um, you know, I just took a really quick stab at, you know, how, uh, yeah, it's going to take more time as well. It's going to take more memory. Uh, but I just took a quick distribution pass at, you know, here. Uh, when sampling, I just feel like it's just an overkill if we went for a thousand words, right? It's just an overkill. Gotcha. Um, so it's going to train faster. Um, it's not going to add more value. So it might be different for other use cases. So uh, one way to look at it is if every word and uh, for your use case, it's really important. We can take the max length of uh, the review and pad everything to that, right? So but every this is, or, this is different from things that I'm used to working with because a lot of the stuff that I do in my day-to-day -day job is more database oriented and every single piece of text matters. It's, yeah. it's you know, the right concern on every piece of information is it has to be replicated in six availability Correct. zones, so on and so forth. Correct. Um, but this is this is more this is almost like a it's almost like artistry and science blended together. It's, it's yeah. interesting. I've never thought about this before. You, so you need we, all the data. Yeah. So we were thinking about the axis, right? So it's like, well, do I? Here's what I'm trying to do with more data. Um, does more data really add value? Is the question. It's like. Well, what's the least amount of information I need to make a decision, right? Um, so, so that's kind of the rationale is, uh, and we can certainly, maybe if we have time at the end, we can use, uh, uh, we can rerun the code with uh, the entire, uh, keeping everything constant and more data and uh, uh, rather keeping all, say thousand uh, words and see if we get something better. Uh, okay. that's, that's what trying. Uh, I'm making an educated guess here because, um, you know, You've we're doing so something important. simple. We're doing something simple. So it's, you know, if 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 you are doing so, you, you didn't have to wait for the last 500 words to bash a movie or say something good. <laughs> so that's that's my. Huh. All right. The only so time we'll I do... can imagine writing 900 words about a movie is maybe Inception or Interstellar or The Martian, you know, just... Uh, a luxury of time, uh, I hope we all... <laughs> so we'll look at the NDRA um, interface of MXNet. You go to mxnet.io. So I'm lazy to do. So it takes, um, you know, three... Uh, parameters essentially if you look at this. Um, so data iterators are good uh, be uh, because you can, you know, um, they have interfaces where it's simple to interact with. If you think about parallelizing the operations, you can just run yield operations uh, to kind of extract. Um, uh, so generators, you don't need to keep everything in memory. You can th get things in on demand, right? So so it's a nice interface, memory efficient, uh, easy to parallelize. Um, and in this case, uh, as you can see, we have shuffle. Uh, we have a lot of things that are built in uh, that we can just leverage. So it's a, it's a good practice to use iterators. Um, so that's, uh, that's the iterator. Um, we'll need to give it data and labels. Right, so our data, so NDRA iterator, so X train was our array, and Y train is our labels, right? So, and then what we'll do is we'll say shuffle equal to true. Uh, but there's also another uh, component here, as you saw, is called batch size, right? So now what, what we do is when we uh, train, um, we we don't we don't go through single samples at a time. The uh, the reason being, uh, we are you know let's say we are using GPU. GPUs are really good at parallel operations. So to be computationally efficient, uh, we need we we usually batch the data and compute the error. Uh, on an average uh, in the batch. So, so batching is a good idea. And, and so when you say batching, is that 
one whole review that we're batching, or is this going to be the set of words that we're batching? Um, so if you look at uh, the array we have in uh, here, right? So a review is a collection of words. So so let's say we have we have twenty. Our input vector is twenty five thousand. So each row, if you look at each row, is a collection of words. We converted the collection of words to uh, a, a collection of numbers, essentially, because we converted right. words to so numbers. So we, ID, correct, correct. Um, but what we'll do is we'll we'll take 128 reviews at a time and send it together. Gotcha. Because I, yeah. I, I was just trying to keep the shape of the data in my head, and it's a little bit hard. Right. Because we have a we have a, a few different variables that are the same shape, and then there's some that are, are, are a different shape, and it, it, I'm just right. making sure I'm keeping track of all of it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll summarize again. So if we look at X train, um, so X train of zero, this is how it looks like. So what it's done is, see, 500 words. Right. And um, and you can see it's a, it's a bunch of, um, oh, sorry. So it's uh, it's padded with zero, right? <laughs> and then uh, so we've we've padded uh, uh, initial words um, rather than padding it at the end. It, it just did that by default. It really doesn't matter for this use case. So this is where our actual review words are, right? The last 155 or so words. Gotcha. So does that make sense? It does. And then okay. we basically go through 128 of those, and then another 128, and then another 128. Right. OK, x test, and y test, right? So, so we're going to create iterators, and we can, uh, OK, all right. I think it's iterator. And Twitchy ML oh, is asking, how, how much should we sanitize the data before putting it through the training? Because we've we've not really done too much data sanitation here. We've just stripped out kind of the angle brackets. Correct. Somewhere. Yeah. So um, this data set, we we're lucky that um, you know it's it's been sanitized for the most part, and uh, you know I just try to remove a few like. Um, you know, whatever angle brackets because there was script from HTML. I thought that, you know, we didn't need that. Um, so typically, um, you would spend a lot more time on sanitization. Um, in this case, also because it's words, uh, we just said, uh, well, um, you know, if if things appear, uh, we could have gone and, you know, scraped, uh, you know, flower braces or something else we think was not useful from a word. We could have just kept alphanumeric and so on. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers it. No, I think that makes sense. One thing I'm curious about is the regex that we wrote earlier, and I'm sorry that I keep interrupting because we're, we're kind of messing with the flow here. The regex yeah. that we wrote earlier, we're stripping out the angle brackets, but we're not necessarily stripping out the HTML within those angle brackets, are we? Yeah, we didn't. Like, I was just, that, that was purely me showing that. Hey, um, this is a step. You can do this. Uh, gotcha. Uh, okay. So trying to be more generic, and uh, maybe some steps are uh, not necessary for this use case. Uh, but I'm. I want to walk through what are the general practices. What do you do? Um, wh how, how do you think about this? So that's kind of uh, what, what I want to do as well. Yeah. No, makes sense. Okay. All right. Time to build. All right, guys. All right. Now it's time to build the model. <laughs> OK. Um, what I'm going to do is actually have a little uh, cheat sheet. I'm making a cheat sheet that I created um, that we can use. So. Um, this is always cool because uh, you know it's hard to remember syntax. Uh, it's also 
uh, one last thing for your brain to remember as long as you know where to look at. Um, so kind of like really cool examples here that we can just pick and choose uh, to create our uh, network. So we're going to use this multi-layer perceptron network. Um, and uh, I was looking to see, um, you know, what are the stuff that we need to uh, declare this. Um, so MXNet, um, so we saw, right, there's a, a data part, uh, there's a data input part, and there's a output part. So input and label, essentially. So we need to declare a placeholder variable. So most of these uh, uh, deep learning frameworks are uh, declarative in nature. So some, something like a TensorFlow, which is declarative, which means uh, it's similar to SQL, right? Where uh, you, write, uh, you write a query, the engine, underlying engine optimizes the, the query for you, but it's less flexible in terms of, hey, uh, how do you write loops? Uh, how do you uh, do more things that are imperative, right? Um, like we saw with the whole data processing thing, it was super easy with Python. So um, MXNet kind of combines this, uh, which is for mixed networks. It combines this uh, with um, both imperative and declarative interface um, so that uh, people can write the uh, you know, programs in a more flexible manner. So the network itself will be declarative. So, uh, so we need placeholder variables. So, you know, our uh, data, um, so MX not symbol. So we need to declare our data variable and we'll need to declare our uh, target, which is our uh, output, right? So. So if I could just summarize what you said to make sure that I understand it, it's basically like symbolic math that we're doing here. It, you know, it, we're, we're defining the pipeline that we want the, the data to flow through, and then we're going to click at the end and just say, run it. Correct. Okay. Correct. So um, as you can see, uh, you know, by default, um, the... Um, by default, our data uh, iterators have taken the data name as data and softmax label. That's just uh, that's just what the iterator does. So we're just going to say we're just going to declare those variables, uh, placeholders. Okay. Uh, so we'll do one, one additional thing at this point. Um, is we need to create a word embedding. So we have all these words. Uh, but it doesn't quite make sense to the neural network what these words are or their relationships. So we'll use a technique called embedding. So embedding is essentially, quite simply put, going from words to numbers uh, in, in a vector space, a word to real numbers. So what I did was I created a little, um, is that visible? Yeah, I can see it. So, you know, our algorithms don't understand text. We need to kind of uh, transform this into a continuous space. And also, we have a lot of words. Uh, you know, our, our vocabulary was like, what, 10,000 words. Um, so it's, the dimensionality is pretty huge. So what we'll do is, with this embedding technique, we're going to reduce the, uh, we're going to bring it to a lower dimension uh, so that, you know, we can visualize, we can kind of, inherently create uh, similar uh, similarity between words, a so contextual similarity. So there are many techniques to do this. Uh, one of the uh, common embedding technique is called word to vec I have a little link here, uh, which I can share with people how to create it. But intuitively what it is doing is trying to put words that are similar together. So maybe we'll have apple, orange, uh, and other things, uh, you know, coexist in a space. Whereas like hockey, football, soccer uh, what, might exist in. What is the data structure that creates that kind of embedding? Because 
I, I like you said, there's so many different dimensions. I like you just highlight a few yeah. here: verb tense, male, female, country, capital. Like, yeah, w w are we just going with positive, negative in this case, or we're grouping on on synonym? I, I mean, I no. So, so the embedding takes a, a dimension. So, what it does is it converts the word. So, let's say uh, uh, we convert into a vector. So, we'll take uh, the word uh, and say. Hey, our uh, embedding size or dimension is 12. So it'll be a vector of size 12. Okay. So, so essentially, we we go from words to into a, let's say we pick 32 as our dimension. Uh, it'll be a 32 um, yeah, dimension vector. So okay. that's kind of what this example kind of shows you. But what's cool is uh, because these words with similar contextual, um, uh, you know, kind of like end up together, uh, we can actually, uh, uh, you know, move uh, or calculate distances between these. So the word to work, uh, there's a cool example where they've shown uh, when you embed, um, let's say like man, uh, man if you subtract man with, uh, by woman, it's the same distance as uh, king minus queen. Right. Uh, so, so it kind of ends up in this um, uniform space. But uh, so we create a uniform space, continuous space, uh, so that the network can learn uh, because I it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, because it, it doesn't understand raw text or like how or the text structure is. So we're giving it a structure. Cool. And it's. Pretty simple. I, I mean, we, we don't we we don't need to do anything except uh, uh, you know calling a um, calling an embedding function. So embedding so embedding so it takes data, and then uh, the other thing is we'll need to have our uh, dimension set. So we'll We'll basically say uh, data equal to data here, um, input dimension. Um, remember, that was our uh, vocab size, which was 10,000, I believe. And uh, there you go, number of words. And our output dimension. See, we're going from words to vectors, right? So output dimension will be, um, let's say, embed size is 32, right? So everything is a 32 um, uh, uh, vector. So we can we can just give it a little name called embedding layer. Okay. Okay. Um, what what we're gonna do now is actually um, so the network doesn't you know we're gonna actually change the dimension of our array. Um, and we're just going to flatten it. We're just going to make it a single, uh, from a ND array essentially to a, um, um, for lack of a better word, uh, a single array. So we're going to use this function to flatten this so that our network can, um, um, uh, it goes through the network. Um, so, And we'll pass it through the embedding layer, right? So we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we basically, as you can see, what I'm doing is connecting a chain, right? Does that, um, do you see that? Uh, yeah, like, I mean, I see that you're, the input of one is the right. output. The output of one is the input of the other. I see that you're, you're building this like pipeline. Yeah, um, I think uh, what I'll do is now let me actually switch to um, some basics. I think it's, it's about time that we learn uh, maybe a little bit about neural networks before we actually go code them. Okay, it's basic structure. So a neural network has three essential three types of layers, input, hidden, and output. Uh, input layer, of course, it's obvious. Uh, this is our input. Output layer actually 
is um, what, the, uh, what the network spits out. Remember in this case, uh, we want to say, hey, how likely is, um, how, how likely is the network, um, you know, um, or what does the network think? Is the review positive or negative? That, that's our output layer here. And in between is the hidden layers. So the hidden layers is where all the magic happens. So it's being transformed. Uh, in, in our case, we'll have an embedding layer. An embedding layer is going to connect uh, to another layer where it's going to map all these inputs and figure out the relationship between the words. Um, and then it's going to build um, and it's going to pass on to the next layer. Uh, so what, we're, what it's we're done. defining some of the layers, but then there are sub layers essentially that are happening in this hidden layer section that MXNet is, is responsible for. Is that right? Um, no, you're actually implementing the hidden, you're saying what the okay. hidden layers look like. Okay. So we're defining, uh, so we have to define what type of a network it is. So in fact, we're literally building this network where we'll have, um, we'll basically have two hidden layers. Um, um, uh, so, and this is called a fully connected layer um, because, uh, you know, from its name, if you can't infer, it basically means that all the neurons in this layer are connected to every other neuron in the previous layer. So gotcha. that's a fully connected layer. Okay, so, you know, uh, what, what, what we are essentially trying to do is figure out, uh, so as you see, there's a connection between each of these neurons and it's associated with a weight. So how strongly are these two neurons connected, right? So, so that, and every, every connection pair essentially has a weight. And the whole job of training is to figure out what these weights are. Like that's essentially what we're doing in a neural network. So we're basically assigning vectors from one node to the next node to the next node. Correct. So we, we have, uh, so each, so we'll basically have a weight matrix um, and, uh, uh, and we're computing the weights. So we'll initialize the weights uh, with some random values. And what we're trying to do is, oh, that doesn't quite work. That's a wrong. So the whole process is finding that weight, the right set of weights or parameters uh, for our, uh, uh, for our uh, you know, classification function here. Make sense? It does. And, and as you can see there, right? So a, a change in any of the weights uh, it, it means that there's a change in the output, right? Because uh, uh, it, it's kind of a weighted, uh, uh, put it very naively, it's a weighted sum at the end, um, more complex than that, but you know, in simplistic terms, it's a weighted sum. So if you change the weights, the output uh, uh, probabilities will change. Um, loosely put, like our, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of looks like this, where you know neurons connected. Our function, I I, I swear we won't go a lot into math, but <laughs> uh, essentially what we're trying to do is um, we could, we're trying to compute a function which is uh, a sum of all the weights and all the inputs plus a bias. So W i is the weights at the ith layer, xi are all the inputs at the ith layer, uh, or ith neuron, uh, essentially, and then uh, uh, we, we, that's our neural network function. You with me so far? So just to, because I get that not everybody knows mathematical notation. Frankly, I haven't looked at this stuff in literally 10 years. Uh, my God, I'm getting old. Um, so that's some notation. If you scroll down again, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's some notation where you have this, this X zero. So this is like layer one 
x0 is the actual neuron. That's the actual node in the graph. That's the, the value. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, you have a weight, which is w0. Correct. Correct. And that forms the, the, the connection of those two items forms the, the pointer, the, the edge between the two nodes. Yeah. So let, let me just simplify. Uh, we, we don't need to necessarily know all of this. Just remember, we're trying to compute some weights, right? The neurons are connected to each other. Uh, we have a weight matrix. We're trying to find the weights. Like that's, that's our problem. So I'm not gonna go too much into how it's done, but here's a learning process, right? So uh, here, uh, all the weights are initialized. Um, but what happens is, um, you know, we have a label X, but our, our rather our output is ex expected output is X. But uh, let's say when we send a sample through it, our value is X prime because you know we just initialized everything with random weights, correct? The whole process is, hey, how different is X from X prime? And that is determined by something called as a loss function. So the loss function tells us, you know, how uh, different X and X prime is, and we compute a delta, and that delta is the correction in weights that we need to change. Okay. So that process is called back propagation. So we are, we have arrived. So we went, you know, we went through the network. We arrived at a value, but that was not the correct value we wanted. So we, we found out, hey, what's the, we then compute, hey, how far uh, off are uh, these, uh, this value? And this is done with respect to every weight in the network, right? So every new. We're, and, and there's nothing preventing us from computing those in a parallel fashion, right? So we can, we can compute every single weight and then we get to this value and we back propagate and, and we say, okay, well, this is the difference from where we were looking for. So let's go and, and right. run this again. Right, right. So we go back essentially. So uh, we, our loss function uh, essentially uh, tells us how far it is. So we actually calculate what's called a derivative. Uh, and this is where it gets into math, uh, which I promise to stay away from. But essentially we calculated some delta correction in the weights. And as we go back through the layers, we correct, uh, uh, we rectify the weights. So the weights get, weights change in the back propagation phase. And this is how the network learns, right? So we're saying, hey, get closer, get closer. X and X prime should get really close. And when you get close, that means that, well, I, I, I'm, I have the right weights to do uh, what I'm doing. Gotcha. All right. This is one crazy slide, and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this, and then we'll code. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find we're trying not to get trapped in these like local minima on this plane of existence of, of you know, different. And we want to figure out a way using, and the, the loss function allows us to get to the global minimum instead of this, like. So this is kind of, um, you know, if we kind of visualize the space uh, of the loss function, this is how it looks like. Uh, but the idea is uh, that um, we, we have to go and find a direction where we can get to the global minima. So this kind of optimization is uh, called non-convex. Non-convex because the function has many crests and many uh, mountains. So think of this analogy as like we're skiing down, right? So we're at the top of the mountain. We need to get to you know the lowest point, and um, we're trying to see, hey, if I go in that direction, I can I can actually uh, get to the global minima. So we, we take steps uh, in that direction where we think it's the steepest and that's gonna eventually lead us to the global minima, right? Gotcha. So, so that's the whole process. And we, can, we have a parameter where we can adjust how many steps we take in that direction. Okay, 
All right, time to go code again. <laughs> So the, the thing is, we just need to know, all we need to do maybe as developers and just know that that's happening. We don't need to do anything. We just need to say, hey, take five steps at a time, take 100 steps at a time, something like this, uh, what, what we call is a running rate. And depending upon that rate, uh, we're just gonna tune uh, our network. So we don't need to do all this math. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to know necessarily know exactly what it is doing. We just need to know, well, um, based on what I see in the network, we need to take faster steps or we need to slow down. That's what we need to know. Okay. So, so I'm gonna declare um, our first fully connected net network. Um, but as you saw, um, if the weights were linear, Right, like so. There, there are weights between. There are weights between. Uh, where do you go? Yeah, there are weights between these networks. Now, if they're linear, then you know we're not going to get. Uh, um, we're not going to get really complex models. What we need is, um, you know, fractional values, or we need non-linearity, uh, to to be able to uh, solve com more complex problems. Um, so also because as we back propagate, we're actually running a gradient or a differentiation function. If it's step function, uh, then our derivatives are not gonna, we're not gonna be computing derivatives. So we need like a nice curve. So we'll add that nonlinearity. So just know, simple thing is, We'll have a fully connected layer. We need to add a nonlinearity in our functions, and uh, um, we can just <laughs> use built-in built-in functions. Uh, so, so we're basically I'll saying we don't want a, you know, a pointer to a node. We want a direction to travel towards a node. Yeah, I mean that's that's computed. Uh, but what I was saying is. Um, we we can't we can't achieve those uh, crazy functions uh, and shapes if you're not using nonlinearities, uh, because the the whole point is so there's something called as the universal uh, approximation uh, theorem. So um, essentially, a neural network uh, can approximately solve any problem. Like it's it, there's a mathematical proof. Now as Fancy as it sounds, it's really difficult to achieve uh, the right parameters, the right inputs. It takes a lot to kind of model the problem in the right way. Um, so that's where the difficulty is. So theoretically, we can solve anything, but practically, uh, whether it's uh, the algorithms, data, uh, uh, the actual compute needed to do that, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we'll use something called as ReLU, which is rectified linear unit. Um, and uh, I won't go into details. Let's 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 continue coding, and we can go into theory uh, if people want to know. So we'll just treat this as a black box for now. So we'll pass the activation. I'm okay with that. Num. <laughs> So in this case, um, what we'll do is at the end, we'll just use a uh, number of hidden nodes as two. Any idea why two, Randall? Uh, is it because those are the two? Well, when you say number of hidden nodes, do you mean the number of hidden layers? No, number of hidden. Uh, so it's the number of neurons at the end. At the end, as right? An so, yeah. So, since we have uh, just two, we're just trying to compute the probabilities. How likely is it negative, and how likely is it positive? We need two here. Gotcha. So every. Okay. So max output. Well, why? Why are those called hidden? 
<laughs> uh, it they just came up with. Players. Yeah, because uh, I, I don't know the exact. My my speculation is because a lot of people, um, we we are operating in nonlinear spaces. It's hard to visualize, know what's happening. It's kind of like, hey, there's a lot of magic, and hence uh, probably the name hidden. Okay. There might be a better answer to that, but uh, yeah. I don't think that should do. Um, so we can actually plot our network. Uh, so this is a really cool, um, really cool tool. Clearly, I missed something. Um, to actually see how our network uh, uh, know, looks target like. Target should be capital V. Yeah. So. Um, What's our table? Yeah, target. No. Target should be capital V. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, there you go. Can't find argument output dim. Maybe it's output dim. And all right, there you go. Wow, OK. So, data, so this is embed layer flattened, fully connected, and then the non-linearization component. Yeah. So, thing. yeah. So this is what's happening. Our data is fed into the embed layer. We flatten the data, and there's a layer. There's a fully connected layer which has 200 neurons, right? Now the output of those uh, get through a, a activation function. Then it gets mapped to a fully connected layer with two neurons, and each are going to kind of map to positive and negative, and then we send it through an output layer. Uh, we use something called as a softmax output. Now the softmax is essentially um, again, there's a lot of math. The easiest way is to say is uh, it's 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 a log likelihood. What it's going to do is suppress things that are it's going to normalize how uh, our uh, our values, and we're going to get probabilities uh, on which are defined as negative likelihood. So we'll see, hey, how likely is um, something uh, to be positive? How likely is something to be negative? So we're just converting into probabilities in the log scale because um, we just there might be bigger values and so on. Right. Okay. So there you go. There is our network is ready. So remember, we're gonna we had this concept of iterations, right? So we were gonna uh, show the network. Um, you know, um, we're gonna show the network the same set of samples many times so that the network learns. That's always a good idea. So those are called epochs. An epoch is when uh, the entire training set has been seen by uh, the network once. That's an epoch. Uh, so, so I'm going to declare uh, uh, you know, our, our model. I'm just going to call it model. So MXNet has a module interface. So, module. so you can kind of see here. Um, so this is what it does. So we can. I'm going to try and copy this. Or All right, so a module takes the symbol. In this case, we're going to say MLP. That's a symbol. Context. I'll just keep it CPU for now. Uh, we'll just see some. Uh, we'll just see some fun. Um, and uh, actually, sorry. Uh, we can skip the data names, um, uh, or we can just have it. Uh, so these are the placeholder variables that we declared. We didn't really change them, so we can leave them as default. That's fine. Uh, well. 
going on with those quotes. <laughs> yeah, I know. It doesn't, uh, it tries to be smart and then uh, it doesn't allow you to just have a single. <laughs> So we're going to use this uh, function. Uh, uh, now, now that we've declared it, we're just going to run the network. So here's the whole thing, right? Remember, you were talking about building a pipeline and right. then entering. So we'll just literally call a fit a function called fit, and what it's going to do is get all. It's going to do all the heavy lifting for us. Get all the nodes. Uh, get get all the uh, data. It's going to distribute the data. It's actually going to um, you know train. We just need to give it parameters. That, that's that's as easy. Um, so I don't know if I have an example for fit function here. There you go. So, so fit, give it the the callback, and the callback is just like a progress checker. Yeah. So correct. So module interference. As soon as you start training this, I'm going to run go get some water. But if it trains in like two seconds, I'm going to be disappointed. You should be happy. No, it's a CPU. It's probably not going to um, be in that space. So we'll give it the iterator. So so it'll give. Uh, so we'll say train iterator. This is our evaluation data. Remember, this is a validation set. We'll just use the test iterator for now. Um, so we have different optimizers. Uh, so the simplest one's called stochastic gradient descent. Um, remember the whole the process again, of going, stochastic gradient descent. That's how. That's the whole process of walking down that slope. Remember. That's the. So that's, that's the. the that that thing's doing the magic. Yes, that optimizer. Uh, we'll use something more modern. It's called Adam. But I. Again, you can guess. <laughs> so, up, so remember, I was talking about the steps you take down. That's called the learning rate. So, I'll just uh, point one is a little high. We typically might end up using point oh one or oh one. That's usually a good learning rate to start with, and we'll see how our network, you know, performs. So, eval metric is. Um, so essentially, after each epoch or after each batch, we want to see, hey, how accurate is this network? Uh, so you can define your own custom, um, uh, you know, um, evaluation metrics. But what I'm going to do is use just accuracy, which is essentially a direct comparison. It's going to say, hey, um, one equal to one or one equal to zero, and so on. Right? It's it's just going to do a direct comparison. Okay. What we'll do is I'm going to add a callback function um, just so that we get some really nice things that, you know, some, uh, some, some typing here, uh, uh, some print messages. So I said callback, uh, it's called speedometer, speedometer. Um, that's, uh, so I'm going to say, hey, call back um, every 10 batches or something. And that should work. Uh, but what I need is um, I need to enable logging. I always forget. It's a get basic logger. Um, yeah, logging dot yeah. basic logger, or like if you if you want to do like logging dot basic config or something like that. Yeah, uh, I think, and then yeah, missing an, a G on there. Where? Oh yeah, uh, and I forget. Uh, I think that should do it, right? Uh, I think I need to do a set level. Do you remember? Logging.debug um, or logging.info? Yep. Uh, set info. OK. All right. We're going to hit. We're going to train now. Uh, 
Okay. Well. Uh, get basic logger. Do you know or? Uh, I can find out really fast. I if you just do um logging, help. Um. I guess. There you go. Get okay, it's raining now. Okay. You wanna get your water? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna run go get some water. We'll be right back. Yeah. Let me see if. All right, guys, as you can see, um, you know, it's taking a bunch of time. Uh, we're still in the first epoch. So what I'm going to do is really pause and show the power of GPU. Right? So we, we executed for 30 seconds or so. So it's as easy as changing one parameter there. As you see, like context.gpu, uh, uh, mx.gpu can be CPU. I'll also show you how to do this on multiple um, channels. So Randall, so remember like our progress was pretty slow, so I decided to use the GPU, right? So it, it was as easy as you can see how quickly it just like goes boom. <laughs> Is it done? It's printing a lot. It's, it's not <laughs> done quite. Maybe I'll increase the batch size so that we don't get too much printing. So you can see here, our training accuracy is increasing, kind of, sort of, um, here. We started at 44%, it's, it's increasing. And is the goal to just train it until it's at 99 or something? Yeah, I mean, we'll see, uh, we'll see how much we can achieve. Uh, but yeah, so, something like that. So we want to get to... Are you running we want to get to as high as possible, right? Like we might not be able to achieve um, that. So, is it bad that it's going back and forth? Sort of. Um, uh, I mean, in the first uh, epoch, it's it's really hard to say. Uh, so we only got about forty percent accuracy. Um, when we train the first one. And so, if we switch to GPUs, does it go faster? I mean, I don't know if you're running this on a GPU or correct. If you're running this locally. No, no, it is. So it, it does it does speed up. Um, so what I'll show folks is how easy it is to I might have other things running here. So I'll just say mx.gpu of i or I in range, I'll just use four GPUs. And see, that's how we can do distributed training. That's about it. I literally go from having, um, you know, changing that line into a list. So too many slices are empty, so I'm, I'm going to redo my, um, it just gets into a weird state. If we just restart okay. the kernel, we could... Okay. Too many slices. Uh, uh, when I get into this state, I just restart the yeah, kernel. Yeah, no, I kind of, I'm trying to avoid that, but yeah, sure. All right, we'll go execute everything again. Maybe a good time to recap as well, right? So right, let's recap. the data. We cleanse the data. We tokenize the data. Remember, we 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 don't wanna <laughs> we don't have words. Excuse me, sorry. Yeah. Now we're gonna have our test and uh, training set um, sequenced. We're gonna create our labels. We're going to pad because we want everything to be of the same shape. GPUs. We created our network. And now we train. Um, yeah, probably have too few uh, batches.
I'm using four GPUs, I'll just use five one two. We just have too few samples for to actually really use all the horsepower here. <laughs> gotcha. Well, uh, I'll just stick to single GPUs right now. Okay. So this is the first epic. It's going to run for a while. Yeah. So um, I don't know how much time we have, Randall. Um, um, we're about done. We have maybe 15 minutes left. Yeah, so I was thinking maybe I'll um, use a trained model and, uh, uh, you know, show you guys how, uh, you know, complete the rest of the 15 minutes or so. What's your idea? Uh, yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. So let me... So um, saving the model, so let's say the model was saved. We can literally do something like save checkpoint and give it a, like a, a name, um, which is essentially a prefix and the number of epochs. Like that's how easy it is to save a model and just just as you can imagine, right? Loading the model is equally. Yeah, equally simple. So I'm just gonna stop this guy so that we can run. Um, I think I have a model called IMDB. Oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, don't save over it. Yeah. I think it's called num epoch. Uh, again, cheat sheet. Um, well, uh, because I didn't checkpoint uh, the whole thing, so I'm going to use a different interface. So it's, it's actually in the model object, so uh, we'll just do. Um, I think that should be this module. Equal to I think it's load. Um, um can't remember. I mean, you can always run help on like. Yeah, I was trying to avoid uh, so IMDB symbol, so we don't have the file. Well, I'll just do this. Oh, I don't have it. I think it's called. Uh, okay, this guy. There you go. All right, cool. there we have. So we have our model. Um, so we now need to actually uh, bind our, so we'll just bind our, we'll just say, hey, uh, because the module object is interchangeable, we use the same thing for training. We'll just say, hey, uh, we're gonna not, um, we're going to not, not be training with this model that we just uh, loaded. So we only want to perform the forward pass, right? We won't back propagate. So for training, go to false. And then uh, we need to give it uh, the data shape that it's going to learn, um, or rather it's going to expect. So in this case, we'll say, Hey, it's called uh, the variable is called data. 
and the shape is going to be one because we're going to send we're not going to batch we're just going to say one right and we're going to say numbers uh 500. what's that variable called max length yeah max length. right so we're going to use max length here uh the shapes that was uh it's always annoying when uh there we go all right so we got our model um the thing is um we'll we'll, we'll create a little uh, input widget um I think, uh, Randall, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to copy paste Go some code yeah. Um, yeah. so that uh, we can um, we can quickly show the outputs. Um, so I'm going to use a widget text area, essentially create a, um, a little widget that we can uh, you know, type in a review and see how uh, the model does. So it's really cool that you can embed all this in Jupyter, right? Um, but what we'll need is we'll need a submit function. Um, so we'll need a submit function here. It's just like dev handle submit uh, with the data in for the. Yeah. So what this is going to say is, uh, hey, I'm going to get some value. I'm going to run it through this prediction sentiment. Uh, you know, this model variable. Uh, we're going to call it. Red underscore model uh, and whatever the text value, and we're going to capture that in two uh, uh, two two labels here. But we also need to remember we did all this processing with our input data, right? So the output data also needs to kind of match and ha uh, has to be treated the same way, right? So um, I have this little uh, helper function here that's gonna. That we can use. Um, so what it does is uh, we'll take whatever sentences come, we'll make it into a sequence again, we'll tokenize it, we'll convert into sequence. Um, what we'll do is we'll essentially use the word index that we created earlier, right? So we had a word index, right? So um, this guy, this toke, we're going to use that uh, index to actually create our sequence because we need to have we need to map to the same words that was in our training set. So essentially, as we type, these words will be tokenized. Uh, then we'll make it into sequence. We'll pad it, and then uh, we'll send it to the model. And then we just if we use a word that's not in the data set, we just um... no, it'll, it's going to throw an error, right? Like, uh, and we oh, can try that as well. So, uh, widgets, widgets. Uh, from Pi. I need to improve. To from I Python. Python. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there you go. Little box. Um, so, if you just okay. put in Randall, 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 since that's not in the data set, probably, it'll just. As you can see, there you go. Gotcha. Uh, actually, uh, it. Sure, for some other reason, but it's actually gonna. Let's see, da, 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 print model. Or where it is not defined. There you go. Yeah, print model. Okay. So if we do Randall, that's the sort of. Um, so you're why don't I just? You're looking for a dot forward, right? To try and. Yeah. What I'm thinking is, uh, I'll just, I'll just get a, I'll just get a pre-trained one uh, over here, and do it there. So. Okay, Randall is actually. <laughs> 
probability from um, positive sentiment is a hundred percent. I'm just saying. <laughs> so let's let's do this. Uh, singing in the rain is one of my favorite things. Boom. That's positive. That's positive. What happens if you say least favorite things? Good, good point. Let's see. See, it, uh, uh, a model is not that good uh, in but terms of. What if you put of, in uh, my one of my least favorite things? I, I still think it'll probably be the same. I'm just curious. So. Okay. Actually, that's so. Here's another thing, right? R remember. Uh, so our data set was too, uh, uh, like we didn't have a lot of uh, um, uh, values that were really small, right? So we, we need to have something that is representative of the same. So you can't expect, so you can't expect to have all the input values that we trained with something that's crazy uh, long and then give it something short because it doesn't necessarily have, it's not learned that. So it's really important to- Twitch, you guys should type your review of this yeah. episode, type a very positive review and then type a very negative review and we'll see if our model can detect that. Yeah. And make it make it, you know, 100 words. 50 words at least. <laughs> yeah, 50 something of that. Let me get something um, let me get something from the data set itself um, so that we can send um, We have a request to try, uh, I don't like this movie. So what Sunil was saying for the people on Twitch is the, the data set wasn't trained on short sentences. It was trained on like longer reviews of movies. It's very negative. Oh my God. A mean spirited, repulsive horror film about three murderous children. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right. As you can see, that's like overwhelmingly negative. <laughs> so uh so yeah so that, that that's an example so we can um so we need to say um you know something that is uh, at least you know a couple of sentences so um i'll send you something now my review of this episode so let's say blake edwards legend of fiasco begins pointless combination of ego Look at that. That's, that's, you know, still pretty negative. <laughs> that was negative. I was thinking, um, if anybody is on the new England side, I think, let's see if it, uh, you know, we like to say, um, wicked cool a lot. So let's see if that's positive or negative. Um, we have a request from Twitch to put in the input of I don't like this movie. This is too uh, small, so I'm going to say uh, because there are too many plot holes. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah? Oh, negative. Great. So again, we didn't we didn't really train. So the model that I trained was about eighty five percent accurate. Um, so you know we we need to find where uh, you know times where we can get actually um, get uh, to you know ninety five percent ninety eight percent accuracy. Uh, and some of that is enhancing the data set. Uh, so uh, as we saw here. You know, we only use 25,000 um, you know, words. Maybe we can use more. Uh, and then uh, we can change with different optimizers uh, and so on. So also, instead of looking at one word at a time, we can look at words that appear together, right? So we can have like least favorite or something that's, uh, 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 you know, a double negative, things like that. So are usually captured when you use something called as n-grams. 
N grams is essentially a sliding window uh, over the word. So we'll capture four words at a time and five words at a time rather than um, you know just a single word. Right? Does that make sense? It does. I think that's like a Google interview question is how do engrams work and how do you build them? <laughs> I had some uh, somebody from Boston asking <laughs> something cool. Let's see. Uh, OK. That's positive. Was Sorry, I couldn't exactly use what you had there, but. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we, we got to close it out. This is kind of the end here, but this is way cool. We're, we're going to post this code on the Twitch page itself for everybody to look at for sure, right? Yeah. So we'll upload this notebook for everybody to check yeah. out. I'll upload, I'll upload these uh, basic slides, you know, talking about embedding, the cheat sheet. Um, I'll post that as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully this is useful. And this is kind of some of the basics, I would say. Um, wait, Randall, so you had a data set, right? Like maybe we should give people yeah, homework. Yeah. yeah, so there's some, there's this, well, Sunil pointed this out to me. There is a Steam Reviews data set. Can you bring that up or should I bring it up? Uh, uh, I can bring it up. Um, there you go. All right, guys. Well, this is actually cool. So this data set has reviews of uh, you know video games. Um, but rather than doing sentiment analysis, we'll, we'll use what we have learned today to do something slightly different. The data actually has uh, how, how many number of hours that a person has viewed. Uh, so maybe we can build something to predict. Get, we'll read the review and say, hey, this guy has played 500 hours of the game or 50 hours of the game and so on. So maybe we can build a model to do that. So I, I would say the homework is go take what we've done today and then next week on Thursday, if anybody has a model that they want us to try, if they've built their own model for this, uh, I will write a review of a game because I have played all of these games, except for Football Manager 2015. I, I <laughs> Whatever. Um, but I've played all of these other games and I will write a review of these games uh, and you can see if you can predict how close I am to my actual number of hours in Steam. Uh, and we'll, we'll actually like try your model live on Twitch if, if anybody gets these done. And if not, I think that we could probably spend a few minutes building our own model yeah. in the next episode, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll just recap uh, uh, for people who are just joining in. Um, but yeah, I mean, one tip I would say, guys, is uh, uh, try to uh, try to like bucket the, um, the actual number of hours played. Um, so kind of say, you know, 50, 100, uh, 200, so on. Um, just discretize it so that it's easier and similar rather than trying to predict the exact number of hours that, because so, I don't so think we have enough data here. You can't quantize it because there's not enough data to generate the, you played 15 minutes more than so-and-so. So you have to choose like yeah. a, a 10 hours. Yeah, buckets. Hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and is the bucketing strategy like orders of magnitude? Is it you know discrete intervals? Is it? Yeah. So what I would look at is the uh, distribution, right? So let's say uh, the max. Uh, uh, so we have anybody from uh, a hundred hours to ten thousand hours, right? So we want like buckets where things will evenly kind of fall, uh, so that they make sense. Uh, because you don't want one bucket to be with just two reviews, uh, another bucket with 50 reviews uh, or 500,000 reviews, right? Like we want to make sure that they're fairly balanced. Okay, cool. So I am going to try to build a model for this, my own model, over the course of the next week. We have a lot of other work to do, obviously, but this is this is fun, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to see if I can kind of make it my side project to build out my own model. Yeah. Uh, we will so be next, next yeah, week. next week we'll do uh, convolutional neural networks. We'll deal with images. 
um, we'll try and find a cool problem and build a classifier to you know, detect uh, images or classify them. Um, so if you have ideas, let us know. Um, we'll, we'll, and any cool data set that is open. Uh, so please, if you're sharing things, uh, give us open data sets so that other people can learn uh, while they do uh, uh, you know, the exercise. So yeah, we'll be back with convolutional neural networks. Okay, so again, thanks everybody. Next week, uh, we will do some more. I'm hoping over the next few weeks, we get the chance to also show you how to take these models and throw them up on a Lambda function and you can build kind of an API that can use this model to, to give a value to your end users. Uh, so, so we'll probably get to that at some point. And uh, again, our Twitter handles, I'll put them up again now. Um, these are our Twitter handles. Uh, and I strongly recommend you also shoot me an email. So this is my email at Amazon. Uh, you're more than welcome to tell me things that you want to see on this stream. We've got uh, four solid episodes for this deep learning series planned. But if you guys come up with anything, if there's anything you want to build or do, I'm certain that we could figure out a way to do that. So any data sets that you're interested in, any models that you want to build, definitely let us know through Twitter or here on the Twitch channel. I think it'll really help us. Um, build some stuff. Again, thanks for joining. I hope everybody has a good day. I'm going to end the stream and uh, hopefully next week I won't be in a cast. So bye everybody. Thanks so much. Good luck. See you guys.